Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport, then this is the podcast for you. Today, I'm with Donald Barron and Mike Hughes, and we're going to take a look at performance analysis. We discuss how performance analysis can be vastly different depending on the sport or club. Mike and Donald will give us some insight into these differences through their time in a wide variety of professional sports, and we discuss the importance of academic research and the ability to turn data into decisions. Hi Mike, hi Donald. Hello Martin, great to be here. Good morning Martin. Morning, nice to see you both. Um, So today we're going to talk about performance analysis and we're going to take a look at Mike's career and, and how it's developed, but before we do, we just get a brief introduction from you both, starting with Mike. Yeah, no problem. My uh, my career in performance analysis started a long time ago, and I blame blame my father for this. He was the first professor in the world in performance analysis, so my my school holidays were spent sort of doing projects for him at work and doing bits of analysis rather than going to work in the pub. It was an easier way for me to make a couple of quid. So I started getting interested in, in analysis because of him from a young age, and then went on to do a undergraduate um, at Birmingham Uni in maths and sports science. Did bits of part-time work for, for England squash while I was there. Squash analysis, and that was my sport growing up, and where a lot of early performance analysis has taken place because, you know, the guys who are doing the research played squash, but also it's quite a nice, easy sport to analyse as well. They're locked in a box. They can't go anywhere, and there's only two of them. So anyway, that was my sport growing up. I did my undergrad, enrolled in an MSc in performance analysis at UIC, as it was called at the time. I got a job at the English Institute of Sport at the same time in 2003, where I think, I believe I was the second analyst in through the door at EIS. They were just sort of starting, it was, you know, towards the, the beginning of the, the UK sport and lottery funding. They were creating the EIS model at the time. Stafford Murray was the first analyst to be employed there. Then I came in, worked across sort of multi-sport for 12 months, then worked with British Cycling specifically and headed up their analysis from 2004 to 2008. Up to the Beijing Olympics after that, I then moved to work for the RFU for eight, nine years as their lead analyst working with the England senior team. And that was through a company called Insight. And then in the last couple of years through Insight, we were working through across multiple sports. So uh, so rugby, football, tennis, squash, uh, skiing, cycling, uh, loads of different sports with lots of different contracts with them, you know, taking the experience and knowledge that we'd built up as a team um, across different sports and, and providing different services. Wow, an extensive career. Absolutely brilliant. That's what we want to hear. Donald. My name's Donald Barron. My but my background is very much obviously growing up passionate about football, kind of an obsessive like a lot of people. I hadn't been a kind of player, didn't have a career where I thought I was going to be a player. I wasn't good enough. So I was looking at other routes to be involved in the sport. Play a lot of people would say that, you know, I, I wouldn't find an opportunity to be involved because I wasn't a player. I wasn't from a football and family. But I sort of saw education, got an undergrad degree at Dublin University in sports studies, followed the kind of sports science routes, found analysis during a, a year abroad in America, working at, you know, a college. Um, in Kansas. So I was involved with the women's team there, lots of coaching, lots of analysis. And that brought me back to doing analysis with the Institute of Sport at Stirling University and, and Dungeon United Football Club as well, which was my team growing up. So that was a kind of a, a sort of surreal experience for someone to go from studying to working with a, a team I'd supported, you know, growing up. And then was at Leicester City for a number of years, working across the first team in academy, moved to Coventry and Norwich City throughout my career. So I worked in the Championship in the Premier League. And moved into the laterally kind of more around scouting and recruitment after working the kind of pre post match training analysis that um you know is kind of typically seen and, and ended up kind of working and trust the the live scouting elements but also the the data analysis um as part of that team to sort of carry out the sort of robust due diligence that's required involved in transfers for sort of Premier League players. Um and then now I've I moved into academia at University of Suffolk to try and pass on my knowledge and then now I'm the applied lead at Loughborough where we're obviously developing courses and wanting to help the next generation develop that pathway for the people to sort of follow, you know, and the kind of experiences people at Mike have had in, in a variety of sports. You've done well there, Donald. You've, you've followed it up pretty well. You know, I've you've done my some, best. You've got I've some great experience. Best. So to kick us off, Mike, can you just expand a little bit on that extensive experience that you have and give us an insight into the role an analyst plays in sports performance? I think now um, the role that it, that you would bracket as an analyst in in particularly at the applied end of performance sport is is really really broad now, and you see that sort of reflected in the job titles that you see advertised as 
data analyst, data scientist, performance analyst, and data strategist, recruitment analyst, housing analyst. And so I think now it's, it's really hard to pigeonhole exactly what analysts do. They, you know, they fill multiple sort of roles within teams and, you know, you, you start to see greater specificity of roles, uh, you know, in these role titles. I think it's important to recognize the different skill sets, you know, what one performance analyst does at a football club in terms of what they deliver day in, day out to their coaches and performance team will be completely different to what somebody with the same job title does at a club in the same league, essentially. You know, one of it might involve loads of video, editing video, putting graphics over the top, creating really nice visual packages. The other one might actually be creating data models, analysing data in a lot more detail, trying to predict performance based on data points and multiple data sources, but they might have the same job title. So, you know, one thing that, that I've been working with ISPAS, which is the governing body of performance analysis globally. We've been working on new sort of competency framework to try to accurately describe what each of these roles do and what what the analyst skills actually are, you know, tangibly, and almost profile them in the same way that we profile elite athletes, what are their strengths, what are their work-ons, you know, where have they got, you know, a rich history of, of delivering performance uh, solutions, where have they perhaps not got so much. And, you know, those differences are fine and people should be comfortable with having, you know, super strengths and, and work on and things like that because nobody's good at everything. But it's about recognizing those talents and then making sure, you know, as an employer and an employee, you're getting the right skill set into the right role to deliver, you know, whether it's ingesting data sources and aligning them, um, passing them and getting into a format that data scientists can then use or is it visualizing the data or is it building software? Whatever it is, it's ensuring you've got the right people in the right places to deliver all sort of the links across the chain, if that makes sense. It's really interesting because me and Donald were talking about competency frameworks only two, three oh. days ago. Wow. Yeah. Exciting stuff. It's, it's, <laughs> common, um, you know, it's a common thing now, isn't it, to try and create a framework? Yeah. Because you can get involved in so many different areas and there's so many aspects you can apply your knowledge to now. And it's almost uh, I, my role now is obviously a lot about developing other people and you've got to try and give them some areas to focus on. Because otherwise, they can try and do too many things and not really have much impact. Yeah. So in, in your sort of experience, because I think our careers have, were very much at the early point of the explosion of analysis in sport. I should also, say that we're old. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. There's not a lot of hair between us, and I think I'm, I'm definitely um, losing that that competition. But in terms of your experience, you know, the roles that you started off in, what sort of things did you focus on then? And then how did it change? Because your career is very different to mine, and you've, you've moved between multiple sports, but different organisations, you know, they obviously have really different aspects that are critical to success. So what, what sort of things did you focus your time on? And that sort of change over time with trends or just the actual sports you were working in? I think, you know, the the process that I try to deliver or have tried to deliver across sport is actually quite similar across all of them. And a lot of it is grounded in, you know, the scientific background and, you know, in the ac academic side and the research side and to have sound scientific principles to underpin what you're delivering in the applied side, I think is absolutely critical. And the two should always be linked and should sort of be used hand in hand moving forward. And one is no more important than the other. And it, I think it's absolutely critical that, that scientific background and that research. And again, my old man being a professor always used to, you know, emphasize that importance to me. And, and having just really good processes at the outset of whatever you're setting up, regardless of the sport, um, is absolutely critical. So good processes around defining what data you're going to collect, making sure that you collect data that's relevant to the coaches and the team that you're working with, collecting that in a repeatable and consistent manner with interoperator reliability and interoperator reliability. You know, all of those classic research methods underpins the start of it. And then the bit that, you know, is, is then, is almost sort of the art of it, is then the relationship building with whoever your key stakeholders are at whatever the sport or the organization is. You've then got, you then got to get them to buy into, into why you think data and video is important and, and buy into your sort of passion for it. And that's almost, you know, that's the art of it. It's then delivering it in a way that lands and resonates with them. And it might just be a couple of key metrics to start with that you know that they really like and, and think that uh, are critical to performance. And you start delivering those and then you might be adding a third one and go, oh, have you seen this? We think this is quite a good predictor of performance because I've done some research in the background and some analysis in the background to show that, you know, 90% of the time, the team that does this the most tends to win. And all oh, right, that might be interesting. And again, deliver that in a, in a, in a format that's, that's edible for them that they can deal with. And, you know, the way that I present data to a cycling coach is very different to the way I present data to a rugby coach. 
traditionally anyway. And again, you know, there's no there's no one set rule for all. But historically, you know, cycling coaches have been very comfortable with large volumes of data. They quite like tables of data. They like quite dry. Uh, whereas a rugby coach will want images, video, clips, not too much data, but some interactivity in there as well. Um, and so it's having those, you know, it's the core principles of how you're going to deliver it. But then the relationship piece is the the absolute crux of anything that you deliver. And we always say, you know, you know, in the, in the company that I've started now, you know, the quality of the work that we deliver is almost directly proportional to the quality of the relationship that we've got with the key stakeholders that we're working with, whether that's the coaches, the athletes, performance directors, exec board, whoever it is. We, we need to understand their coaching philosophy, how they're approaching the sport, what they're trying to get that individual or team to do, what they want that performance to look like, how they want to measure it, and how they see that evolving over time. And if we're absolutely on the same page with them and we, we're totally empathetic to how they're approaching the performance, then we can create a framework uh, and a system to support them to analyse that accurately and reliably over a period of time. I mean, that's some fantastic insights because you covered a lot of areas and I think that the, the key one we're going to really want to dig in today is that buy-in and mm. I, I call it almost capturing the sport and I think it's something in our course that's going to come forward as those key pillars almost is getting the buy-in or building the relationships first and understanding the sport and then you build on top of that but in terms of the different sports you got into you mm. touched on cycling maybe wanting drier information more <laughs> data sharp. might be a bit um, hard but yeah but um, and then a bit more visual and things like that and it's probably more personal discussion but going into a new environment you went into a lot of new sports that probably you know squash was your passion growing up but yeah went into them what did sort of day one or week one look like to actually build that relationship what was the little strategies to use um because you can see as soon as you talk i can tell how passionate you are and you put it across really well but how did you start that with a new coach or a new team or a new sport? Yeah, yeah. And the first thing I would, I would sort of also say is, you know, with the variety of roles that are available within the sort of performance analysis industry, data science industry, you know, all that sort of collective performance analysis, not all the roles are coach based in. So, it, it, what first thing I would say is, it's not, it isn't necessarily for everyone being on the ground as that interface between the data and the video and the analysis and whoever you're delivering it to, that's not necessarily for everyone. There's a lot of roles supporting that. And again, it, it probably takes a, a type of personality, type of mindset that, that would attract people. You know, it attracts me. I'm a bit of a show off. So I quite like, you know, doing that and being in the mixer and dealing with people. And I get a lot of energy working with people. So I, I enjoyed working with coaches and athletes and support staff, but I don't want people to think that that's the only type of role and that everybody has to have that sort of, outlook and outset and mindset um, but in terms of you know just sim real basic things is you know being the first there being the last to leave being you know just available always always available on phone always available on email always available for a coffee and a chat or a beer or whatever you know the culture of that sport or that team is and again culturally every every sport is different and every team within every sport culturally is different as well in terms of how they interact, how they operate, how they socialize together, maybe they don't socialize together and it's very formal, and how they use data and, and apply data is different across all the teams and sports. So there's no sort of one cut and paste model, but again, you know, like three key things that I always bang on about to, to any interns that we have on or any young analysts coming through is, is to be curious. Again, ask good questions. You know, I've never been told off for asking too many questions. And again, in sports that aren't necessarily your sport growing up, that you don't know the history of all the intricate details, asking questions and learning from, you know, the knowledgeable coaches is absolutely critical to accelerating your development curve and how quickly you can start having a positive performance impact on that sport. So you've got to get up to speed with that sport quickly. So be curious, ask your questions, be, be consistent. Again, you know, like I said, I think it's absolutely critical to be, you know, front and centre, first thing in the morning, last thing of the day, we always used to pride ourselves on no one works harder than, than us as a department, you know, within reason, you know, let's not be stupid and, you know, <laughs> and absolutely flog people. But you're there first thing in the morning, you bring energy to the environment, you bring in ideas, you bring in work, you're adding value, you're asking good questions, you're a positive influence on that group. Again, you know, if you're, you're dealing with elite, elite level performance, what, what you never want to be is a drain to that environment. You don't want to be something that people 
then have to worry about managing because then you're taking up headspace that we should be focused on the performance of the athletes. And they're the, you know, they're the important ones here. You know, with Vestal in the World, you know, we are there to support and facilitate that performance by supporting the coaches, the support staff and the athletes in whatever way we need to. But it's not about us. I really think we've got to be there to be consistent energy givers and be positive influences on that environment. And then, you know, like the final thing is, I always say is be a hostler as well. And I don't mean that in like the Del Boy terms of flogging stuff out the back of your van down the market. I mean, be innovative, find solutions, make stuff work. Donald, you'll have been there where you're setting up for a Mac and the feeds aren't coming through from the camera truck and you've got to sprint down there, liaise with whoever the broadcasters are, get some new cables run or test the feeds down there, work out what the problem is. All right, it's my end. Right, I've got spares of this. Let's swap this out. Right, still not working. I've got a spare of this. Let's swap this as an app. You've got to find solutions yourself. And, you know, particularly in the applied end, you know, there's usually a kickoff or a tee off or whatever it is. And that's, that's a pretty hard stop. Like they're not going to, they're not going to move kickoff for you because your bit of kit's not working um, or you've not found a solution to a problem. Like you've got to be, you've got to be able to think on your feet and problem solve on your feet and just be a hustler and, ma- and make stuff happen. And again, you know what it's like, you know, as you, as you get a bit older and you start to manage, you know, groups of people or, or teams and things, most of the time with the best of the world, you don't really care how something's happened as long as it's happened. And you just want someone to come back and say, yeah, that's all done. It's, it's sorted. It's taken care of. I don't need to be told the detail of, oh, well, I had to do this and then I had to change the cable and then I had to plan this and I was it's like, okay. But when you're starting out, you need to be that person that finds the solutions rather than making it somebody else's problem again you're then taking up headspace for somebody who should be focused on something else so you know those would be sort of the key sort of three things i would always always emphasize on, on people starting out be curious ask your questions be consistent and be a hustler mike I, I absolutely love what you just said and <clears throat> just to bring context to this we've done a similar podcasts around s and c and around mm. um, psychology and my, my area is more sport management all of those things that you just said are essential in all of these areas of performance sport and, and, and sport management. So, you know, some of those things you just touched on, the art and the science, you know, that balance between the art and the science, I think is something that students mm-hmm. need to get their, their heads around. A phrase that we used to use in, in the kind of S&C personal training world was understand before being understood. And mm-hmm. I think people get the wrong way around. People go in and say, yeah. I do this, I do the other, as opposed to let me understand what's going on here first. And then I can kind of bring in what the, the tools that I need in this certain situation. Mm. And I think that's the same. You mentioned personality. And, and I talk about this with sport management, that people need to understand kind of what works for them, what they're good at and their skill mm. set. And in my world, I mean, you, you can expand in different areas and get better in certain areas, but you not, might not want to. And you might want to really specialize in one area because that's what you're really good at. And that's as good as being broad in all areas as well. Um, and then the final one you mentioned around the culture of the sport. And, I've, you know, you touched on it nicely with, with cycling and rugby mm. and understanding that whole thing and knowing how you can impact it is essential, whether it's S&C, psychology, even the media marketing side and sports management. A lot of those skills are the same for everybody. I just love how you put it across. Mm. Yeah, and, no, I'm glad, I'm glad that resonated. And, and absolutely, it's that, like I say, it's, it's building that trust with whoever you're working with. And that doesn't come overnight, no matter how, how good you think you are or how good you think your CV is. People, like you say, you're absolutely right. People don't really care until you build up the trust with them one on one in that in their environment. And again, it, it's, it is the art. You're, you're absolutely spot on of, of building relationships, building trust, and then as you build trust, more responsibility will be given to you as as the trust increases, and then the quality of your work go up as you're given more responsibility. But it starts with with building the trust. And I remember first meeting going into huge football governing body and walked into the meeting and you know um, one of the senior management were in there and he literally just said right impress me but don't give me anything from any other sports I don't care I don't care what you've done in tennis rugby squash whatever I want to talk football now impress me with football and that was it and it's like right okay yeah that's your mindset and and, that, and that's the thing and then yet we had to gain his trust over a period of time by saying look we know we know football as well. We can deliver in football, et cetera, et cetera, and without using any other examples of, of other sports. I've gone about this for ages. I do uh, lectures around presenting for business, 
and I again I express that point that mm. people don't care about loads of things. You need to know what they want to know, and you need to sell and get into that audience yeah. for what they need. But I can see Donald's chomping at the bit for, for some performance analysis questions. So there's, Donald, I mean, yeah, in. there's some great insights in that. I think that's you know there's a lot of relevant points there that you know you could pour over because you'll be put in scenarios where you will be asked to almost condense the knowledge of your whole career and maybe have 30 seconds to impress someone mm. and they'll put it right on you right there and then. So those are yeah. all those kind of things that you need to be able to react to. Some will take a long time and tease out and wait, be patient and sort of see how you react. Some people literally, they walk at hundred miles an hour and you, you've got two minutes to impress them. So you've yeah. got to be ready at all times, haven't you? And, and be on your game. You've got to be ready to deliver, which is trying to, delve into probably more like the Olympic side of things because that mm. was probably the early part but British cycling obviously has been you know lauded for a long time in terms of the innovation the performance how that was created and built from probably quite a low base in terms of you know resources financially um it, it, as a sport but it's now obviously you know a huge part of British sport the Olympics so can you give us some insight of what it's like being in that Olympic cycle because you've there's obviously competitions in between that, but it's a four-year cycle. You've got that planning time. What was it actually like to work in? And then how did the kind of almost like marginal gains process act out, you know, be involved in it? How did that sort of, you know, play out for you as an analyst? And how did you play your part? Yeah, that was, a, you know, a fascinating programme to be part of for a few years. And and like you say, it's been a sort of steady growth over a long period of time. You know, you, know, you go back to sort of 90... When did Chris Boardman win uh, Duke Gold? Uh, 90. Was he at Barcelona? Um, it's coming off the top of my head from somewhere. 96. Yeah, it might be like 92, was it? Anyway, uh, a long time ago. So that, that basically, that was almost like the germination of, you know, the, the British cycling ethos. And he, he started that with Peter King uh, in the 90s. And, you know, with, with the success that he had and then the next couple of guys, they started to get a bit more funding, started to get a bit more momentum until Dave Brailsford came in, sort of early 2000s, and then things, you know, continue to grow from there. Um, so like you say, it's been, a, it's been a long process for them to get where they are now. It's not, certainly not been an overnight thing, and a lot of very, you know, bright uh, and clever people, like I say, people like Chris Boardman and Pete Keane for a long time were involved, got it sort of going. And then Dave came in and, you know, really sort of coined that phrase with, uh, with Matt Parker around aggregation and marginal gain. And a lot of that was was based around bringing in a lot of external consultants who were very clever people, but taking a lot of the performance back to basically core principles, fundamental principles, which cycling lends itself to because a lot of it can be modelled using physics and aerodynamics and roll and resistance and all these sorts of things. It can be modelled very accurately, and what you you know what you get on the lab in a in a rig and the data that you collect for that about you know peak power, max minute power, and things like that, you can pretty accurately predict what you know Chris Hoy is going to do on the track for a kilo based on his numbers in the lab. There aren't there aren't loads of surprises because you can factor in all the aerodynamic kit and, and the bikes and, and based on his power output know pretty much what that performance is going to look like. So a lot of it was, you know, finding the marginal marginal gains around all the different sort of aspects of performance, whether that was, you know, around nutrition, uh, as I say, aerodynamic materials and skin suits. So we spent, you know, from 2004 to 2008, I don't know, you know, they still do it now. We spent hours and hours in the wind tunnel every year developing the kits and the equipment that the guys were using. And, you know, it would, you know, the detail that would go into how the bikes built. And again, they were all bespoke and, and custom built for British cycling and for each of the riders. And, you know, and you'd be testing the, you know, on like a pursuit bike, the angle at which the handlebars are mounted and the stands, which are only, you know, an inch or so long be testing how the your angles the angle at which they are mounted how moving that one degree affects you know the drag of the bike in the wind tunnel so you do it at one degree then you do it like one and a half degrees then two degrees it's not a particularly exciting process i'm not gonna lie you're stuck in this wind tunnel with no no wind for some reason they have no windows in wind tunnels either so you're in the black pitch black all day with the noise of the wind tunnel running all day it it can be uh, a wearing process so we do that for like a week at a time then you'd have riders coming in, testing their positions as well, find, find the most aerodynamic position. So we had to sort of create feedback methodologies around that so they could see the position on the floor whilst they were in the winter. Anyway, and then they try to find a position they think they could then hold, hold on the track. And then we, you know, get high-speed cameras onto the track to film them, to see if they were replicating the position they had in the tunnel. 
on the track and trying to take that into you know into the field and so you know the, the sort of aggregation of module games across all these sort of different areas of, of tiny little things and and detail that at the time British cycling were going into but other other nations necessarily weren't and you know the the British cycling team always believed that you know no matter what other teams were doing take from that what you will no matter what they're doing if we if we pick up all of the positive gains from all these little areas and all these little details around supplements, looking at um, bicarb loading or beta alanine or whatever it is, if we're picking up all these tiny little uh, bits, whatever they're doing, and it, again, it might be within the rules, it might not. If it's not within the rules, that usually means that they're, they're lazy and they won't be, certainly won't be going into the, the detail of these other areas. And so that gave everybody confidence that the way that we were approaching it was the right way and that by taking the time and the energy to go into all these details, we would always be better than the other teams because we thought harder about it. We'd have got brilliant experts in to help us with this. And then that would translate into the performance on the track. And like the funny thing with sort of track cycling is, you know, quite a niche sport, not that many velodromes knocking around that you can go and just have a ride around. And so there's only, there's only five events a year, really, you know, five big events, four World Cups and a World Championship. So over an Olympic cycle, you've only got at most 20 events before the Olympics. You know, people talk about big data and, you know, in some ways you can get big data from the power cranks and measuring all that and analyzing that and speed and cadence and heart rate. You can get a lot of data from it off. But in terms of like event data, you got 20 races. Like that's not big data. That's tiny data. So, you know, picking up trends across that time is actually really quite difficult. So, again, you know, there's a lot of video analysis, a lot of uh, tactical analysis of how riders ride, trying to profile them and profile the sprinters, like when they usually attack and things like that. So. You know, there was a huge range of areas covered to give. And essentially the reason that, you know, all these areas are covered, A, because, you know, there's a lot of thorough people, smart people working on it. But it was then so that the rider, when they were on the start line, no matter who they were up against on that start line, had the confidence to know that every stone had been looked under in terms of preparation for that performance on that day. You know, over the last four years, like we haven't taken any shortcuts. We've investigated everything. We've analysed everything thoroughly. We've worked on every facet of this performance so they can then stand with confidence on the start line, have no sort of doubt or, you know, no clouding of their, their focus or mindset because they are in, you know, they've been prepared to the best of everybody's ability for that performance on that day. Yeah, so there's, there's, there was a lot of detail, obviously. Mm. It's, it's this, this summary of that. But the... The process itself sounds like obviously there was key areas that had been broken down, wasn't there? And then it was iterating. Now, an important thing that for me that stands out straight away from my background in football, you're competing every two or three days or at least every week. And you know, like you said, only 20 competitions in multiple years. We could easily have that in a few months. But you get that regular feedback of, is what you're doing working or not? Or where are your strengths and weaknesses when you, when you actually have to deliver? Mm -hmm. And that big thing we, we talk a lot in analysis is context is king. So where are we right now? Where do we want to get to? But we, how are we checking that? Or what, what feedback are we getting on it? And how do you compare to everyone else? So all that work was going in. Obviously, there's a lot of huge amount of effort from lots of people. But with only events every few months or so, what, what did it feel like? But also, how how did the athletes interact with that? If you're asking them to change something, it could be quite dramatic and they might not find out if, if they, that helps or hinders the overall performance for several months or even for like, you know, a world championship, there's, there's years between them. What was that kind of process of working with the athletes and if there was any pushback and then what, how, how did it feel to then actually have such long spells between knowing whether you were actually reaching your goals or not? How, how did that sort of process play out? Yeah, so like you say, rather than having lots of matches or performances by which you can gauge whether you're getting better, you're having to use training data, you know, yeah. most of the time, whether that's on the track or in the lab. And again, because, you know, cycling can be, you know, boiled down to a lot of the fundamental principles and, you know, essentially, you know, power output sport versus your drag versus your rolling resistance, and then that's going to be how fast you go. You can boil a lot of it down to sort of core uh, phys physics and uh, fundamental principles, and so you can. It's, it, it, from that respect, it's fairly easy to sort of track improvements in certain areas. You know whether that, as I say, some of the metrics on the bikes, some of the metrics in the gym, 
blitz on the track and, and things like that. Because the sport is driven by a lot of that stuff, you could you could chart that progression over time. Like you say, there, there were occasions where you know there had to be sort of fundamental different you know changes made in perhaps rider position or even events that riders competed in, and then they wouldn't have opportunity to compete in that event for quite a long time, and that took a lot of trust. So again, you know, it was a big trust thing between the athletes and the coaches that they bought into the plan and each of the riders had their own support team and essentially the rider was put at the centre of the support system. So in other sports, sometimes it's the coach. Um, within British Cycling at the time, the rider was the centre of that. They could choose who was in their support team and they were very much, you know, fundamental in driving what their programme and their training plan looked like. So that buy-in from the from the athlete was absolutely key, and they then trusted in the team that they put around them to then deliver on the plan that they, you know, bought into with the input from the rest of the team. So it was always very much a collaborative effort in terms of this is the plan. It was never sort of dictated to them. You're doing this. You're doing this. It was always driven from them as well. And so then that helped with the whole, you know, trust and buying into the plan. And again, you know, that is across any sport, you know. One of the huge coaching dilemmas is it's not necessarily the plan you've got in place or the quality of that plan or whether it's the best plan in the world or not. It's, it's aligning people and getting people to buy into the plan and believing in the plan and pulling in the same direction. And, you know, what they did well was, you know, they had some hugely talented athletes who took ownership of their performance, created performance plans with their coaches, with their support team that they bought into and then completely committed to. And again, that is, you know, huge credit to the athletes who were involved at the time because, you know, that's that's not an easy thing to do. And they were, you know, hugely motivated, dri- driven people to do that. And that was sort of the, you know, the driving force behind those, you know, those performance plans and trusting the training data, trusting the methodology and the training plans and then the taper going into competitions and going into the Olympics and, and trusting in the people that were supporting them and advising them. And then those races were sort of markers, like on the way to a bigger a bigger goal at the end. Just not many of them. So yeah, it's it's very different to a lot of other sports where you're performing week in week out. You know, training almost for footballers at times becomes maintenance and some like tactical tweaks rather than anything physical. Whereas cycling, similar for rowing and and another A to B Olympic sports, most of your data is from training. <clears throat> Mike, you touched upon the um, like a player led approach. Mm. And you, meant, you mentioned big data as well. I'm just wondering, in, in other sports, in any sports, how are you translating that big data into something that can be a player-led response? Donald, you've probably got experience of this with football as well, so it's probably a question for both of you. The concept of big data in sport you know, makes me laugh sometimes because you know, for Olympic sport um, and certain you know, international sports, international football, international rugby, You've only got at most 12 matches a year, maybe 14. You know, again, that's not big data. You know, there's not huge amounts of trend analysis that you could do, certainly from event data on that. You know, even with some of the physical stuff, you know, that's not a big data compared to other sectors or, you know, the banking industry or commerce or whatever. So big data in sport, let's, you know, let's take that with a pinch of salt. It's not, it's not that, it isn't that big, really. Where it does start to, you know, start to grow a lot is where you've got a lot of training and match data. From multiple sources so if you're taking in gps data with tracking data with event data with heart rate data with diet you know and things like that and then you're starting to align multiple data sets whether or not that's big data or not i don't know but the, the difficulties then are more around aligning data passing data and getting it into a format that you can then work with and then drive the insights and drive the learning from and again that's the bit that people care about they don't really care about you know the data itself they want to know what actions have we got on the back of it? And a lot of the difficulties are around getting these multiple data sets into a format that you can then interrogate or synchronize with video. Because again, data will tell you what's happened. You know, they'll, they'll give you results and they'll tell you what's happened, but it won't tell you how or why. So it might show you that there's a problem, but it won't tell you how to fix it. A lot of the time you need the video to supplement it to understand why something is happening. Is it a tactical thing? Is it a technical thing? Is it a physical thing? And then you can come up with a plan to, to then correct it. So, again, we always think it's absolutely critical to be able to align the data with the video, which, again, is quite a challenge. And you might not send a video for every session and things like that, but where you can to align it as much as possible to then bring the data to life. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of you know key points in there. And I think the, in my experience, the, 
the data sets that we've been using have changed dramatically over that kind of 15, 20 year period from, like Mike says, you've got individual performances or maybe sort of cumulative totals or you know, some very basic overlaying data, but then the introduction of GPS tracking data and the event data, you've now got these data sets that are they're sort of more in, in football and sport as being bigger data sets because you've got everything that's going on for multiple players in you know every tenth of a second, et cetera. But like Mike said, it's it's trying to get these data sets to combine together so you can understand the context. And I think when you're using that information, the things I would always focus on is trying to have a visual for the video, some sort of visual representation of what the data means and really short summaries, but actually describe it and talk in a a language the athlete or the coach understands. So it's more you're talking about the tactical terms of football rather than you've had 60% success rate for your penetrative passes, which there's been a bit of a debate online and social media recently around how do you translate and present your information. And for me, it's always you present it for the end user, not for me. I'm not trying to show off or show a cover. I'm, if it takes one sentence to have the impact I want, I'll deliver it in that way. And that's the most important thing is we're not just trying to collect and interpret the data and show off. We're trying to collect information that is useful and then has an impact. Because it's about like um, I think Mike's touched on it already. Is we're in the background. We're we're not here to be in the front and the limelight. We're we're there to help other people be successful. And you know, and it's great to be part of that. But I think that the the data that's available is obviously far more complex now. But it's you're always then trying to reduce it down to something that people can understand. And, and is useful. I think we've, we've got some great insights into the world of performance analysts and, and their role. Um, I know we're starting to come towards an end now, and I'm certainly keen to have a look at your, your career highlights, Mike, and you know, what, what have been the, the key highlights that you've had in performance analysis, and what advice would you give to anybody who's looking to move into a career in performance analysis? Start with the first bit. The career highlight would have been the um, 2013 British Lions Tour mainly because I did the tour with my best mate uh, from school, Reese Long, who's now head of analysis at the FA. Uh, we both did that Lions tour together and worked in the analysis team uh, for the British Lions, and they won the series. So that's, that's sort of the fondest memory of, you know, doing what was, a, it was a brilliant tour. It was, it, you know, it was great fun, but doing it with your mate as well was uh, was awesome from school. So I remember us, you know, getting up at, you know, whatever time it was in the morning, watching the 2001 Lions tour when it was in Australia then. Like we go to the to the pub the night before, sleep in the lounge, wake up at sort of seven, hung over, watch the Lions match, and then go back to bed. So to, to do that with him was definitely a highlight. In terms of advice, having a a scientific background in it, a taught background, and understanding some of the scientific principles and methodologies is is important, even if you're working the applied side. So look into courses, you know, plug for look for MSc starting this later this year, getting the foundation in that. I think it's going in with expectations at a realistic level as well. It's not all test and winning. It's, it's you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's hard work, it's graft, it's sat in front of a laptop, crunching numbers, pouring over video. And, you know, I'm not trying to put people off, but if you love sport and you love, you know, trying to understand what goes into performance, which I do, and trying to capture that and capture a way to improve that performance and, and you know, win um, at the weekend, then it's, it's hugely rewarding and, and hugely exciting and fascinating. But it's a lot of work, a lot of hours. And like I said, uh, building up those relationships to enable you to then provide the data and the analysis takes time, energy uh, and, and commitment. And so, you know, don't go into this lightly thinking that you can just sit around offering your opinion, you know, as if you're sort of sat in the pub. You've got to have hard objective data to sort of back up what you're feeding, feeding back that is, is captured with rigour and, and scientific principle. Mike, Donald, I think it's been absolutely brilliant talking to you guys. You've given us a, a real insight into the world of performance analysts and, and their role. Both of your careers extensive across, you know, the Olympic cycle, but also team sports and lots of detail there in cycling. And obviously giving, giving students some insights into what that world's like and what, what they need to do if they want to work in it is absolutely brilliant. So I just want to thank you for your, for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be on and yeah, I hope to catch up soon. Thanks for listening to the Loughborough Sportcast. If you want to get in touch and let us know any subject areas or experts that you'd be keen to listen to, then contact me, Martin Foster, on m.foster at alborough.ac.uk or tweet me at martinfoster82.
Bye for now. We'll see you next time. <laughs>